During my talk on Ezra Pound's Portrait d'une femme, I mentioned that two other authors had done poems called Portrait of a Lady. One of them is T.S. Eliot, and this happens to be one of my favorite poems. I mean, there's so much that we could talk about, but I don't want to ramble on and on, so I think we're gonna have to focus on a specific theme, epigraphs. So last time we talked about the idea of the woman in the 1920s when we did Portrait d'une femme by Ezra Pound, but I don't want to focus that much on women for this poem because the question of analyzing women in poetry is very complicated. Feminism is one of those things you have to be very careful with in respect to literature because I think when a lot of people are analyzing feminism in literature, they often forget that our idea of the modern woman, especially as we understand women today, is very different from the idea that T.S. Eliot or Ezra Pound would have been working with. So our idea of the modern woman probably comes from Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, which was published in 1949. So we have to remember that the toolkit of concepts and phrases that we're working with today when we look at feminism in literature is not the toolkit that T.S. Eliot would have had. And in fact, T.S. Eliot's understanding of women was probably very, very different from our understanding of women. We also have to remember that authors basically before the 1990s were looking at all these different groups of people in different lights. So this brings us to our topic for the day, which is the epigraph of Portrait of a Lady, which comes from The Jew of Malta, which is a play by Christopher Marlowe. Christopher Marlowe is not typically taught in high schools or for that matter mentioned in high schools or really anywhere. Marlowe was a playwright living during Shakespeare's time. He was basically the big deal of the time and was very successful in the 1590s until Shakespeare came along and basically stole all his fame and stole all of his ideas. So some people argue that Marlowe should be given more credit than we give him, but it's pretty obvious that Shakespeare is the better playwright at least. So here's Marlowe. I just discovered that I can use certain photos in these videos without copyright issues. So that's very exciting. So around 1590, Marlowe wrote this play called The Jew of Malta. So if you're thinking Jews and Elizabethan drama, the first thing that is going to come to mind is this guy. Yes, this is The Merchant of Venice by William Shakespeare, which was published after Marlowe's Jew of Malta. So most scholars agree that the Jew of Malta was very influential to Shakespeare's work. Why? Are we talking about Christopher Marlowe and Shakespeare? This is supposed to be a video about T.S. Eliot. What does T.S. Eliot have anything to do with these really old guys? The epigraph of Portrait of a Lady is taken from Act 4 of The Jew of Malta. I have now pulled up the epigraph here. Thou hast committed fornication, but that was in another country. And besides, the wench is dead. I think a lot of people tend to ignore epigraphs when they're reading poems or novels. T.S. Eliot was a fan of epigraphs. An epigraph is basically a piece of literature that's supposed to tell you a little bit about the work without giving too much away. Usually epigraphs make the most sense in retrospect and epigraphs are very famous for creating a dialogue between different works of literature. T.S. Eliot uses this epigraph from the Jew of Malta and you might ask what is an epigraph from a play about a Jew doing in this 1915 poem Portrait of a Lady. In the Portrait of a Lady we have a sketch of two characters who are in some sort of relationship. We're never really told what. We can assume that these characters have some sort of a friendship going on. They might be in a more intimate relationship. So we might suspect that Eliot is choosing to include this particular epigraph to represent some sort of accusation from the lady to the man. But if we look at the poem and if we look at the Jew of Malta, the Jew of Malta, by the way, quick one minute summary. It's about a Jew living in Malta who is forced to give up all of his property to the government of Malta to help against a Turkish invasion and he's forced to give up his house which is consequently turned into a nunnery and it turns out he has this treasure hidden in the nunnery so he asks his daughter Abigail to join the nunnery to 
retrieve this gold of his, this wealth of his. So she does that for him and then she quits the nunnery and then he has all this wealth, he buys a new house, he gets a slave to help him out to seek revenge on all of the people he thinks have wronged him. He causes his daughter's lovers to kill each other. His daughter goes into deep mourning and joins the nunnery again and he's furious that she abandons her Jewish faith to convert to Christianity and basically poisons everyone in the nunnery, including his daughter. The only people who are left are these two friars who decide to try to convert the Jew of Malta to Christianity. Of course, they fail to do so, and then he ends up killing both of them. And then there's some other stuff that happens in the end that's less relevant to our discussion today. I have the book right here. The line from Marlowe is actually a dialogue. The way that the line appears in Eliot, you might assume that this is sort of an accusation or an absolvement of sin. But if we look at the Marlowe, one of the friars who comes to convert Barbas, who's the Jew of Malta, he says, thou hast committed. So that's the line of Friar Bernadine. But then if we look at Barbas' line, he says fornication, but that was in another country and besides the wench is dead. This is a complete joke in the Marlowe. It's, it's funny when this line is spoken because he's just conjuring up some completely arbitrary act that has absolutely nothing to do with what he's actually doing in the play. And that's remarkable because it brings up this vein of the absurd. Now that we know that this has nothing to do actually with the real deeds or the actual sin. I mean, what Barbus does, he basically goes around murdering people. That's a lot worse than fornication. We might conclude that Eliot puts in this line, this epigraph, because he wants to suggest something of the absurd in this idea of fornication. He might suggest on the one hand that the sin of fornication is completely trivial in relation to all that the Jew of Malta has done. That's one reading. Another reading might be that maybe this sin of fornication, which has nothing to do with what the Jew of Malta is actually doing, has the same relationship in this poem. Maybe the reason that Eliot puts this in is not in fact to suggest that they are in a sexual relationship, but to suggest on the contrary that whatever this man and this woman have done is a lot worse. So what is this deed that's worse than fornication? Perhaps the betrayal of a friendship, the inability to form genuine human connections. Thou hast committed fornication. But that was in another country, and besides, the wench is dead. Among the smoke and fog of a December afternoon, you have the scene arrange itself, as it will seem to do, with I have saved this afternoon for you, and four wax candles in the darkened room, four rings of light upon the ceiling overhead, an atmosphere of Juliet's tomb, prepared for all the things to be said, or left unsaid. We have been, let us say, to hear the latest pole transmit the preludes through his hair and fingertips. So intimate, this Chopin, that I think his soul should be resurrected only among friends, some two or three, who will not touch the bloom that is rubbed and questioned in the concert room. And so the conversation slips among velieties and carefully caught regrets through attenuated tones of violins mingled with remote cornets and begins. You do not know how much they mean to me, my friends, and how, how rare and strange it is to find in a life composed so much, so much of odds and ends, for indeed I do not love it. You knew. You are not blind. How keen you are to find a friend who has these qualities, who has and gives those qualities upon which friendship lives. How much it means that I say this to you. Without these friendships, life, what cauchemar. Among the windings of the violins and the ariettes of cracked cornets inside my brain, a dull tom-tom begins, absurdly hammering a prelude of its own, capricious monotone, that is at least one definite false note. Let us take the air, in a tobacco trance, 
admire the monuments, discuss the late events, correct our watches by the public clocks, then sit for half an hour and drink our box. Now that lilacs are in bloom, she has a bowl of lilacs in her room and twists one in her fingers while she talks. Ah, uh, my friend, you do not know, you do not know what life is, you who hold it in your hands, slowly twisting the lilac stalks. You let it flow from you, you let it flow, and youth is cruel and has no remorse and smiles at situations which it cannot see. I smile, of course, and go on drinking tea. Yet with these April sunsets that somehow recall my buried life and Paris in the spring, I feel immeasurably at peace and find the world to be wonderful and youthful. After all, the voice returns like the insistent out of tune of a broken violin on an August afternoon. I am always sure that you understand my feelings, always sure that you feel, sure that across the gulf you reach your hand. You are invulnerable. You have no Achilles heel. You will go on, and when you have prevailed, you can say, at this point, many a one has failed. But what have I, but what have I, my friend, to give you? What can you receive from me? Only the friendship and the sympathy of one about to reach her journey's end. I shall sit here, serving tea to friends. I take my hat. How can I make a cowardly amend for what she has said to me? You will see me any morning in the park, reading the comics in the sporting page. Particularly, I remark, an English countess goes upon the stage. A Greek was murdered at a Polish dance. Another bank defaulter has confessed. I keep my countenance. I remain self-possessed, except when a street piano mechanical and tired, reiterates some worn-out common song with the smell of hyacinths across the garden, recalling things that other people have desired. Are these ideas right or wrong? The October night comes down, returning as before, except for a slight sensation of being ill at ease. I mount the stairs and turn the handle of the door, and feel as if I had mounted on my hands and knees. And so you are going abroad, and when do you return? But that's a useless question. You hardly know when you are coming back. You will find so much to learn. My smile falls heavily among the bric-a-brac. Perhaps you can write to me. My self-possession flares up for a second. This is as I had reckoned. I have been wondering frequently of late, but our beginnings never know our ends. Why we have not developed into friends. I feel like one who smiles, and turning shall remark suddenly his expression in a gloss. My self-possession gutters. We are really in the dark, for everybody said so, all our friends. They were all sure our feelings would relate so closely I myself can hardly understand. We must leave it now to fate. You will write, at any rate. Perhaps it is not too late. I shall sit here, serving tea to friends, and I must borrow every changing shape to find expression. Dance, dance like a dancing bear. Cry like a parrot, chatter like an ape. Let us take the air in a tobacco trance. Well... And what if she should die some afternoon, afternoon grey and smoky, evening yellow and rose, should die and leave me sitting pen in hand with the smoke coming down above the housetops, doubtful for quite a while, not knowing what to feel, or if I understand, or whether wise or foolish, tardy or too soon, would she not have the advantage after all? This music is successful with a dying fall, now that we talk of dying, and should I have the right to smile?